Um, well, hey guys, um, I've got to talk to a couple of you before uh, everybody jumped in, but uh, I think I'll start off by telling you a little bit about who I am, just so you know who's talking to you for 15 or so minutes. Uh, my name's Josh. I'm from North Georgia. I have been uh, within this movement uh, as a pastor teacher for uh, about 11 years now. Um, I graduated with my bachelor's in uh, theology and apologetics with concentrations in Greek and Hebrew years ago in 2014. Yeah, 2014. Uh, I've been serving at various churches since then, and uh, I write a lot and I do a lot of videos. And uh, I was blessed with the option to come in here and get to teach on uh, one of these topics tonight. Uh, I've chosen uh, identity as what I'd like to teach on uh, tonight. And um, so I think the way that we need to start, though, is defining that term, because whenever I just say identity, uh, it, it's kind of vague. It's kind of like, well, like, do we do we interpret identity as as what people in the 21st century um, with the more with the more extreme views who are saying, well, I can I can just simply identify as whatever I want. And there's no there's no right, wrong or rules for me kind of thing. Uh, I can be what I want. I can say things contrary to my own nature, and I can be that just by my own uh, willing uh, willingness to want that and, and to declare that. And, and that's not what I'm talking about tonight, kind of. Uh, what I would like to mean by identity is um, what believers are, like our identities. Um, and, and we're going to look at like what believers were prior to being believers, uh, and, and what we are now and how that transition happens and what are the implications of that transition. Uh, I like to use the word Christian. I know that's sometimes a word that some people still doesn't, doesn't like to use. Um, whether you, you say messianic or, or Christian or uh, those of the way or whatever your particular uh, preference is, uh, I, what I mean by believers, Christians, is those of us who pledge allegiance to the God of the universe, Yahweh, and uh, through and belief in the Son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, uh, above all else. So your typical Orthodox New Testament believers uh, is what I mean by that. And the identity of New Testament Orthodox believers. Um, the term defined uh, officially by Merriam-Webster's for how I'd like to discuss tonight is uh, the condition of being the same with something described or asserted. So in other words, uh, being being like currently a status of being that is the same as something else already already explained and already described and uh, and, and defined. So I want to talk about what we are defined as, what it is that makes us who we are. And I believe the the most concise definition of a believer is a child of God. And we're going to look biblically at what that means and how we became that and where we came from that. Um, I'd like to go to a classic uh, what I think um, is the greatest identifier for believers in the New Testament, which is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, so if you if you want to read along with me, then um, I'll give you a second to, uh, to flip there or to scroll there or to tap there, whatever uh, you're using. Uh, I'm going to be reading from the ESV. That's my preferred English translation. Uh, also, it is storming pretty bad down here in the south, so if my power goes out, I'm sorry. I'll get back on as soon as I can. Uh, I'll just I'll just phone in with my cell phone, I guess. Uh, so let's look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to break down piece by piece and kind of go through this uh, and show this transition. Uh, Ephesians 2, let's start uh, in verse 2. Sorry, we don't even have to do verse 1. Uh, verse 2, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which, you once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are all his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Uh, so this is, like I said, I think this is the the classic text for identity. Paul, there's, Paul, there's a lot here, and if you've and if you've been in this movement long enough, you know Paul is Paul is that guy that's like it's he's misunderstood by a lot. He's uh, he's very intelligent, and he he likes to say pretty much everything in one long sentence. This is not very few, very many sentences in Greek itself, actually. So he just kind of goes on and on and builds this builds this picture of what we as believers are, uh, as children of God. Um, he begins, though, by explaining not what we are, but what we were. So if we look, according to this scripture, the condition, the natural condition of man and mankind prior to the conversion, the new man moment, is that he is dead. The man is dead, not wounded, not limping along, not just kind of crawling, but dead. Absolutely dead. Uh, and this is in verse 2. In which you once walked, it went, I can never say that apparently. In which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, you were dead in the trespass and sin. And that's what you were doing. Um, so our precondition, our pre-identity is a dead man. Dead man walking along the earth doing what he or she wants to do according to the flesh and the body. <clears throat> okay? Uh, by Because of that, we were children of wrath. Uh, carrying out the passions of our flesh means that we're going to be wrathful. Humans have this natural desire for their own good. We look, we look at we're, we're selfish naturally. Uh, and, and, and we will commit wrathful deeds and wrathful actions because of that. So by nature, as dead men, apart from the living God, we are wrathful. We, we look out for our own self. We're not selfless. We're selfish. Okay? Uh, so it's self-centered, looking out for ourselves. And this is the natural identity of man. And according to Scripture, again, we are, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, we are dead. There is no chance for the dead man on his own. He, he is dead in his sin. There's, it's, just, it's, a, it's a done deal. He is dead. But... But, even though that's our precondition and what we were prior to the conversion, God himself initiates and completes that conversion. In verse 4, we see, uh, uh, by the way, this is my, one of my favorite chapters of all, of all the Bible is Ephesians 2, right behind John 6, which is what we're going to look at in a minute. But uh, that one moment, like right at the end of verse 3, when Paul lays out all this like terribly like, depressing stuff, he's like, we're dead in our trespasses, we're by nature children of wrath, we're self-centered, doing everything according to our flesh uh, and our own desires. And then he uses the conjunction, Allah, Theos, but God. So in verse 4, but God. So all of this, but. God, rich in his mercy, because of the great love he has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. So the condition of man changes in this moment because of God's response to man's condition. Uh, and so he, he, is, he is beginning to change the identity of man in our conversion moment. We're going from dead men to something next, ultimately what we, what we know as child of God. Uh, but, but don't miss the fact that God is the center of this. Uh, and Paul actually goes on here to explain that we contribute nothing to our salvation, that it is God in his mercy has made us alive in Christ. By grace we have been saved, not, of, not according to any work, lest any man boast. There's absolutely nothing we can say to justify, or nothing we can do to make God save us. It, it's not possible. According to Scripture, according to the testimony of Scripture, we were dead, and God makes us alive. He changes our identity. We like to say in, in the pronomia, in the messianic communities, uh, that we get the new heart, that God writes his law on our hearts because he's giving us a new heart. He changes our identity from children of wrath to children of God. Um, and so so Paul is using this, Paul is conveying the ideas here that of the conversion moment. Uh, and his source material is surely the apostles, the, the heads of the church who come before him, Peter, James, John. Uh, and so I'd like to look at one of their sources, like uh, uh, John 6 specifically, of where Paul's pulling this idea, because Paul just asserts it. But God has done this, apart from any work you can commit, lest any man should boast. Now I want to go back to actually when Jesus was talking about the conversion process 
in John 6 so that you can see what Paul has in mind and we can see the full testimony of Scripture of the conversion itself. Um, so this is accomplished uh, pretty pretty short in, in two or three verses in John 6. We're going to look at verses 43 and 44. So uh, I'll give you a second to turn there. Um, to set the, the context for this section of, of John 6, uh, there's a discourse happening between Jesus and a crowd uh, just outside the Sea of Galilee. He is actually, right before this in John 5, he uh, he performs the miracle of walking on water. Peter walks out on water with him, ends up you know losing his faith for a second and going down to the water. Um, and then the people are approaching Jesus and talking to him and like questioning, like, how... Who are you, etc.? And he actually says, "I'm the bread that comes down from heaven." Uh, and they're like, "How is he the bread that comes down from heaven? We know his mom and dad." Okay, so that's the setting of right before he says what I'm what I'm going to read for you here. Uh, he is dealing with people who do not understand him, do not know him, are mesmerized by him, but don't know him as the true Son of God, Savior of the world, Messiah, uh, righteous King of Israel. So in verse 43, John 6:43, it says this, uh, and Jesus answered them. Do not grumble amongst yourselves. No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this is, this is the conversion moment. Uh, when, we, when we come to Jesus, when we, when we decide and we have faith and we believe in the atoning, sacrificial, death, burial, resurrection, blood of Christ himself, that's when we're, that's when we're changed. We, we are imputed with Christ's righteousness in that moment, and, and he takes our place in, in, God's, uh, in God's condemnation and judgment. Uh, and God looks upon him. And, and we know this. This is elementary Christian doctrine. It's, uh, it's orthodox belief. But, but this is the moment. But what has to happen is, is we have to come to that. Because he is the only way to God. He is the only way that we can have this new identity from child of wrath, which everybody has been, and a lot of people today still are. The only way to come from child of wrath to child of God is through the Son. But how does one come to the Son? He says in verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. So I'd like to, I'd like to actually like hone in for just a second on, on that last uh, clause. Uh, the, the words of the Lord Jesus says that we cannot come to God unless God draws him. Okay. Now the word draw, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to paint this in broad strokes. Um, the... The word draw is more accurately defined as like drag, to physically pull something from somewhere else. It's not a coercion. It's not like you're sitting back and God's like, hey, you know, come on over here. It looks really nice. It's cool. He's not like coercing us to come to the sun. He's dragging us to the sun. And I'll give you a reason why that, that is a more accurate definition. The word's used three other times in the New Testament uh, and throughout uh, Koine Greek literature of the first century. Uh, Acts 16.19, the word uh, uh, elkuo, by the way, is the Greek word elkuo, uh, to drag, draw, or to pull. Uh, Acts 16.19 says, uh, But when her overseer, or when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and elkuoed them into the marketplace before the rulers. They dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers, is how ESV translates it. Same word here as John 6. 43, or 44 rather. Uh, another one, Acts 21, 30, says, Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul, and Elkuod dragged him out of the temple. At once the gates were shut. And one more time, James 2, 6, uh, he says, But have you dishonored the poor man? Are not the rich uh, the ones who oppress you, and the ones who Elkuo you into court, that drag you into court? All three of these uh, verses who use the same word here, the majority of English Bibles will translate drag. I can't imagine James was meaning, or, or Luke had wrote, that uh, Paul and Silas were coerced into prison. That's just not how that works. This, this word is a dragging. It's a physical like manipulation, like moving somebody into another place. And so the, I think that the purpose of understanding that word is critical to the identity-changing process because it verifies what Paul says in Ephesians 2, that it is not of any work that we can do, that God changes us. He drags us from our nature, our, our, our origin of being a child of wrath, and drags us into his household, pulls us in by the blood of Christ, 
uh, and it's not of anything that we can do. Our identity is not something that we can establish. We had no choice in the matter of how we were born. We were born as children of wrath, uh, and we have no choice of how God has dragged us into his household. Through Christ, God has chosen and has saved us as, as his believers and continues to do so. The power of the gospel, or the gospel is the power of God to save, as Paul says, and that's how God is changing our identities. No longer are we, whether we want to believe it or not, or verify it or not, no longer are we children of wrath. We have a new heart, a new purpose, a new divine calling, a new family, because God has, God has brought us into that and changed our identity. We're no longer a slave to sin, a classic good song, I'm no longer a slave to sin, I'm a child of God. Because this, this process of our identity is, is God alone. He is the one who is the author and finisher of our, of our salvation, uh, apart, uh, completely apart from any work that we could do. But I think that's important because that's, that's the gospel. Uh, I, I chose identity tonight to talk about because it's so critical for all of us as believers. We all want to say, well, who am I? And, and we have personal identity, like, like I'm a nerdy high school engineering teacher who, who likes to play video games and go fishing and stuff. And so like, that's my personality. I, I, that's my identity. It's the conditions of my life have shaped me into that identity. But my true, my inward, my soul's identity is I am a child of God. And I could do nothing for that. I could do nothing to change my, my natural identity of a child of wrath to be a child of God. Only God himself can, uh, apart from any man's works. So our identities, our identities as Christians is not based upon our abilities our works, our personalities, or anything else we've created and or maintained. Our identities as Christians, as children of God, is based entirely upon the salvific work of God in Christ. By grace we've been saved, for it is a free gift of God offered to man. Uh, and, that, and that just completely and permanently changes our beings. Uh, and so when people say, well, who are you? Or, or what, what is our identity as believers? That's what I want us to know and to recall, is that we are in the household of God. We are God's children. We're no longer slaves. We, we're not, uh, because a lot of times in this movement, especially, we have people who, who treat God like their slave master and not their father. Um, there is a, there's a, a classical show my wife Chris and I have watched. It was called Downton Abbey. It's a British Drama is really good, by the way. It's very clean television if you'd like to watch uh, with your family. But in Downton Abbey, it's it's classical early 20th century uh, aristocrats kind of people. And there's a household where people live, the, the, the family lives, and they also have people who work in the estate. I mean, this, this place is huge. If you've ever seen the Biltmore House, it's kind of like that over in, uh, in North Carolina. Um, and so they have, they have people who live in the house but aren't part of the family. They're slaves to the master. I mean, they're being paid their labor, but the, the relationship is different. Um, the son of the, of the head of the house is going to find a lot more grace in the eyes of the father of the house than the, the servant would. If the servant doesn't do his job, the servant's removed. The servant's kicked out of the house. But if the son or the daughter doesn't do well, then they, they get extended grace and mercy most times, at least to a certain extent. Um, and so they're, they're a permanent part of the home, whereas the slave is not. But thankfully, we who were slaves and treated God, even if like we had this conversion moment where it wasn't actually authentic and we treated God as a, as a slave master, he's like, well, he's commanded me to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to please him. That's not treating God as father. That's treating God as master, as just slave master. And, and Christ has not give us room to think that that's how we're to approach God because we have been changed. We're no longer slaves. We're not bound by the condemnation of our trespasses. We are of the household of God. That is our identity. And we have been permanently changed and redeemed for who the Son sets free is free indeed. So uh, I, I find peace in that. Uh, that, is, that is literally the foundation of my entire faith is that God has given me a new identity as a believer, as a child of God, not as a slave who just lives in the house of God and does what the God wants, but as a son of the Most High Living God. Uh, and I think that that is 
that is the overarching best way uh, to look at the, the testimony of Scripture from, from the words of Jesus to the words of the apostles years later. This is how the early church understood it, and I, and I think that we need to preserve that understanding and, and continue with that and, uh, and share the gospel with that as the center of it because when we share the gospel, our goal is to change the identity or to have God, rather, change the identity of those who are children of wrath, of which, as Paul said, we once walked. So I hope that was uh, concise. I don't exactly know how long I've taken to, to talk about that. Usually I'm super long-winded, um, but I think uh, now would be a good time for some, some questions and some feedback.